Okay, so I'm going to talk about the creation of Butterfield Green, which is really close. It's just next to us. I, I assume that most of you, if not all of you, are familiar with Butterfield Green. It's a, it's a very lovely six-acre public space, um, but it's also a bit an unusual one. And what I want to do is take you through the whole history of the area and what led to the creation of Butterfield Green. And like I said, it's interesting. The title of the talk is From Houses for Votes to a Public Park. So very, very topical. Uh, we're going to cover um, six uh, sections, if you like, going sort of in a chronological order. So Tom is going to be delighted that I'm going to talk about South Hornsey, um, which I think deserves a talk in its own right, but one day. Um, we're going to talk about the Reform Act of 1832, the development of Albert Town. What's Albert Town? You're going to find out. Um, and then the big question, did Stoke Newton need another park? It really depends on who you ask. Uh, talking about the housing development uh, or redevelopment in the 40s and 70s all around us. And then we're going to get to the development of this lovely park in the early 80s. So it's a very relatively young park. The space that we're going to cover is all this lovely green space. And we're just down there. Okay, so this is about to feel green. And I'm sure that whether you see this visual now or even when you stroll through it, you think it has a very odd shape. Right? You think, you know, there's a road in the middle and you have to cross and then there's this little woodland bit and a bandstand that's never used and what's going on. It's not like Clissold or Frinsbury Park or Hackney Downs and so on. And we're going to see why that is. But first of all, let's talk about the area where Butterfield Green is and it's the area where we are now. So this is what the area used to look like back in 1846. Okay, so you can see that at that point, Stoke Newington was still very much a rural village and the whole area where we are now, so we are just around here, with just open fields, just sort of open space. And you can see that in this map, it's labeled Hornsey Parish. And this is the point where people say, Hornsey, that's Herringay. What is it doing here? Well, we're going to see that this was actually part of Hornsey Parish. And this is where Butterfield Green is today, just to give you a sense of perspective and dimensions. But this whole area, up until 1900, was not in Stoke Newington. Ooh, controversial, <laughs> all right? But it wasn't because uh, it was actually part of Hornsey. So parishes would sometimes buy and occupy land that was not actually attached to the parish land. So they had these enclaves. So Hornsey had these two sections known as Hornsey Detached. There was the big one and then the small one. I added just the street names so you can get your bearings, so you kind of know where that is. Um, if you now realize that you live or lived in Hornsey Detached, you've got some street cred now, all right. But just for perspective, so this was Hornsey and this was Hornsey Detached. So you can see it's present day Herringay, you've got Finsbury Park. You can see here that half of Clissold Park, the western half, was actually in Hornsey as well, as well as the whole area here, which is Brownswood Park, okay. Now, when you think about voting in this country, and if you ask people, I think most of them rightly talk about women's right to vote, suffragettes, and so on, 1918, 1928. But if you think about men's right to vote before that, it also had to go through a few stages and a few reforms. And we're going to see why that is relevant to our story. So this is just a timeline that shows you kind of the evolution of voting rights in the country. And up until um, 1832, only one in 12 men could vote. Not nice. The qualification was land ownership and property ownership, right? So really the very few landed gentry, very wealthy rich people can go and vote in the general election. Everyone else, even if you had a successful business and you were actually wealthy, you couldn't actually vote, okay? And there was a whole, you can see evolution of extending kind of the suffrage, reducing the property ownership requirements so more and more men could vote. And that took us to obviously the 20th century and everything that happened then. The Reform Act was really a battle between the Tories and the Liberals, the Whigs. It was about trying to change the system, extending suffrage, but also getting rid of what was called the rotten boroughs. Because of all the movement of people during the Industrial Revolution, you actually had boroughs, if you think about sort of constituencies that had very small, very wealthy people voting. And people thought it wasn't fair, it didn't represent the, if you like, the change in society and the population. So there was this big battle, and as a result of that, the Reform Act of 1832 said, actually, you don't have to be a massive landowner with 
fields and meadows and cows and all that. Actually, if you own the freehold to land that generates two pound in rental income a year, you can vote. Amazing, awesome, right? Uh, it's still a lot of money, by the way, okay? But if you think about lowering the, the requirement, it meant that instead of one in 12 men, it's now one in six. Mm, progress, we're getting there slowly, right? And this takes us to the development of Albert Town, because if you think about it back then, so you had traditionally all the Tory voters, the very wealthy nobles, but then people that were liberals and were trying to start thinking, hold on, so they reduced the, the, the entry criteria. How can we get more voters? How can we create and generate more voters? And that's where these freehold land societies came in. Right? This is the one that we're gonna talk about. So this was the National Freehold uh, Land Society, founded in 1849. These are just some of the founders. And when you read their kind of short LinkedIn bio, right, you get a sense that they fit right in, in Stoke Newington, liberal, um, abolitionists, dissenters, and they were looking at ways of creating these new voters. And the idea was simple. We all get together, we put money, we buy land, we divide the land. You get a house, you get a house, you get a house. You can vote, not yet, sorry. You can vote and you can vote, okay? But that was the idea. And what these freehold uh, land societies did, they bought a big piece of land, divided it to create votes, create liberal votes. In our case, they picked the area that was in South Hornsey, and they built a whole development called Albert Town, after Prince Albert, okay? And they built all these streets. So you've got Wordsworth, you've got sort of Cowper Road, pronounced Cooper, apparently, but I'll call it Cowper, because otherwise some of you might find it annoying. You've got uh, um, Shakespeare Walk without the E, with the E. That's a whole different topic. Okay, uh, and you got Milton, so you've got all the poets, and you also have um, Allen Road and Howard Road, which I'm pretty sure are named after two um, local residents, very renowned. William Allen was a very famous uh, scientist and chemist that lived in uh, 135 Church Street. John Howard was a very renowned prison reformer, also lived in Church Street, where the town hall is today. So this building society effectively built a lot, a lot of houses. Now, you might ask yourself, how many houses? So you don't have to count them, I did, <laughs> okay? Just something you do on a Friday night. Um, so this was the boundary, and this is a lovely spreadsheet that I now own. So you can see the number of houses that were built in each of these roads. Some of them were very small, like St. Matthias Square, and you can see the percentage of the whole Albert Town development. Okay, this is the only type of this development in Stoke Newton, by the way. Um, by the early 1850s, there were about 70 of these societies in the whole country, all right? So there was a big move, a big push to create all these liberal voters. Interestingly, when you look, one of the roads that I like the most in the area is Milton Grove, because all the houses there are so different. You know, it looks like a complete random collection, and the reason is, they didn't get one builder or two builders to actually create and build the whole street. They got dozens of them, okay? Some people built the house themselves as well, right? So you had this complete mishmash of so many different styles, a terrace of two, three houses, and then a big townhouse with four stories, and then it goes down and up and so on, as you can see from them, some of these photos. So next time you go down Milton Grove and you ask yourself, how come all the houses don't look exactly the same, like on Belgrade, Princess May, and so on, because a lot, a lot of builders were involved in these uh, type of housing projects. This is the point where you ask yourself, how many of these houses survive today? Again, I counted, not many. Um, only 27.3% of the Albert Town Victorian houses survive today. All the rest have been demolished. Okay, and you're gonna see exactly why. Some was bomb damage, but not most of it. You'll be surprised. I think there's a, there's a common misconception that every Victorian house that was demolished in London was down to bombing. That's not the case. In most cases, it was down to 1930s, 1960s, and 1970s housing redevelopment. Okay, the bombs were not, it wasn't you know, atomic bombs. They would drop, if it was like a V1 or V2, big damage, you build the whole street, otherwise it's an infill in a row of Victorian houses. This just sort of shows you what replaced those houses in Albert Town that were demolished. 
You can see 1930s housing, 1940s, 50s. The bulk of it, as I said, was 1960s, 1970s housing, 80s, 90s. And you can see that Butterfield Green, which is the, the topic of this talk, was really just responsible for demolishing 92 or replaced 92 of those Albertown houses for votes. People sometimes ask, why, why do we need, or why did we need to demolish all those lovely houses for another park? We've got Clissold, we've got Hackney Downs, we've got Newton Green, and so on. I'm gonna go back now to 1943. This is a really interesting publication. So this is the County of London plan. Um, it was produced, as you can see, during the war, and it was interesting because what they were looking to do was rethink post-war London. Have a look at it fresh and think we have an opportunity to rebuild, but not just to rebuild what was old, but rethink transportation, housing, open spaces. Let's think big. Let's think outside of the box. Okay, because a lot of areas are being cleared. Do we just want to keep them as they were? And there's a lot of interesting observations about what is the required standard when it came to housing, but also open spaces. Now, they did a, a, a kind of a calculation, and they calculated that the standard required in every borough, okay, is four acres of open space per 1,000 people. And guess what? Stoke Newington was only 1.1. Okay, so a big, big way to go to meet that standard. And you can see in this lovely chart, the more affluent um, boroughs that have a lot of open space, obviously the, the population is lower, the more um, East End, a lot of people, very densely um, living conditions and not much green space. Stoke Newington, somewhere in the middle. But all this space, so this was the target of open spaces in the borough, and look where Stoke Newington was, because the only open space was Cleesold Park at 57 acres, and they needed to get to 200 acres of open space in Stoke Newington. They created a, a map, you can see kind of the open space plan, and this was what the, this plan suggested. They were not just looking to create new parks, they wanted to connect all of them. Okay, so imagine you go for a Sunday stroll in Hackney Downs, and then you jump and continue to walk through a lovely boulevard of trees to the common, go to Abney Park, and then, this is all new, connecting Abney Park Cemetery to Cleesold, extending Cleesold north all the way to Lochi Park, and then connecting all that to Harvey Fields. Would have been nice. <laughs> what happened? Um, but that, that was the plan, and you can see here, this was the response from Stoke Newton Council to this plan, saying, look, we're 143 acres short in green space. Nothing here mentions uh, putting a new park in the, the, the more densely populated areas, which were south of Church Street, again, because the idea was to connect as much as possible those existing open spaces that were there. Now, I was curious to know, where do we stand today? You might think, oh, we've got so much green space today. I actually calculated using uh, Google Maps the acreage of all the open spaces we have, even the small footpaths along the New River by the East Reservoir and the West Reservoir, because again, on a Friday night when you finish counting houses, you want to start calculating <laughs> acreages, right? So the reality is that today, and this actually takes into account a future West Reservoir footpath that may or may not happen, all right? But look at where we are today still well below that 200 acres of open space standard that was set in 1943, all right? So the next thing I wanna show you is what happened to Albert Town, right? So they had all these 625 houses. Most of them were quite big townhouses, big, uh, big uh, back gardens. They weren't small cottages at all. When we think about the impact that the war had, this is an aerial from 1944. So this is Albert Town, this is Allen Road, this is Howard Road, um, and you can see all the streets that used to connect Howard and Matthias Road all the way up to Allen Road. There was quite a significant bomb damage here. So this is Shakespeare Walk, this is now the Adventure Playground, oh, this one here, and this is um, Milton Grove. And this is just the color-coded LCC map that shows you the extent of the damage. So you can see there was some bomb damage, and that's the darker colors. But most of the houses, you know, it wasn't like I said, a big bomb was dropped, and especially where Butterfield Green is today, very minimal damage. 
I counted the houses against the color coding, as you do, um, and you can see that as far as the damage and the extent of the damage, the majority of the houses were not badly damaged, okay? Sometimes you just had to repair them, rebuild some things, but that was pretty much the extent of that. What really changed the whole Albert Town landscape after the war was housing redevelopment. So Milton Gardens Estate, which is just behind us, grew organically from the 1930s, social housing, and then there was some building in the late 40s, but most of it, like all these houses, were mid, late 60s, early 70s, mid 70s. They just pulled down all those houses to build modern housing. You might think, oh, but all those lovely moldings and all those great features. Most, if not all those houses did not have a bathroom. They had an outdoor toilet. Electricity wiring was probably very poor. Those were houses from the 1850s, okay? Whereas these new houses, indoor toilet and plumbing, central heating, all those things, right? Just to keep that in mind. So this is really what made the difference, but you can see that in 1977, all the space we're about to fill green is today was still occupied by those original Albert Town houses for votes. And this brings us to the development of Butterfield Green. So bomb damage, minimal, and then the state grew organically and obviously kind of took over all those houses. So how did we end up with Butterfield Green? I mentioned the 1943 uh, plan, and it already identified that Stoke Newington was very low in green space. And that sentiment was carried on throughout other development plans. Um, and even the 1976 development plan for Greater London identified the shortage in green space in Stoke Newington. That plan then led to the Hackney Council Action Area Plan, which led to the more specific Shakespeare Walk Housing Action Area Plan. And after all those years, the area was finally gonna get green space. Stoke Newton was gonna get a new park. This is from 1979. You can see the whole area was declared a housing action area, um, but it took about three years to get everything going. The fact that it was identified as a housing action area was not just about the state of the houses, it was all about the living condition. And you can see that they've identified a number of reasons. Why are you in a housing um, action area? So they say, you know, many houses are in need of repair, improvement, families are overcrowded, uh, the roads and footpath are in need of repair. Interestingly, they say, you know, through traffic and parking in the area creates danger, particularly for children and the elderly. So covering a whole range of measures and interventions that they wanted to implement. And they also talk about the lack of open space. This was a very, quite, um, I would say, crowded area. And Clissold Park is 15 minutes walk and so on. If you're a child, you just wanna go for a quick walk and go and play, you couldn't do it locally. So they decided to introduce a new park. This is an interesting little news clipping from 1979. It describes uh, a public meeting that was held with the council where the plans for the complete transformation of this area were introduced. From what this article is describing, residents or those that attended the meeting were very keen on having a, a park. And you think about the importance of open green space on your kind of doorstep, it's really important. A lot of the parks we have today are Victorian, okay, most of them. So in the 1980s, late 70s, the idea that you can get a whole new park with a play area and you can just sit on a nice sunny day, especially if you don't have a back garden as well, was a big, big deal. And you can see they're saying that uh, Carper Road is going to become a park. And the actual original name that's mentioned in some of the documents was Carper Road Park, not Butterfield Green. And this is what they ended up with. So this is Butterfield Green. So as I mentioned, it was developed in the early 80s. You can see where the, the funding came from, uh, the council, but also other source of revenue. Um, it was developed in phases because of the, the funding cycles. They couldn't just demolish the whole area and create the park, it was done annually. So when they started in 1982, they didn't know if they're gonna get a chance to continue the park to the next street and the next street. So they had to break it into different phases. 
And they actually had to think that each phase might be the last one. So they had to cram as many features as they could rather than think about it more holistically as a single part. Uh, and it was designed by three landscape architects from the council. If you know them, please let them uh, know that I'm trying to get in touch with them. Uh, I tried LinkedIn, I tried Facebook, I tried everything. I'd love to have a chat and hear from them about the, the process. Um, Angela Hodkinson actually wrote an article called A Place to Play in 1990. It's a two-pager that describes the process. It's very informative. So this were the three phases. You got phase one, phase two, and phase three. So that's how they decided to divide it and, and start demolishing the houses and landscape the area and work on it. They got a group of residents to uh, be part of the process. They wanted to get that buy-in. They wanted to have a very collaborative process. Um, and it were the, the residents that came up with the name Butterfield Green, okay? Named after the architect William Butterfield that designed St. Matthias Church, okay? Uh, and they also had some other suggestions and ideas. Some of them were included and some were not. When you think about the size of Butterfield Green, it's only uh, six acres. It's quite packed. There's a lot, a lot going on Right? You think in phase one, you've got a sitting area, the ball games area, the playground, the orchard is fairly recent. You've got the water feature, the green, the bandstand, the woodland, the playground. There's a lot. And part of it was because every phase was almost treated as a standalone. And you can see that the shape was also quite challenging in terms of connecting the different sections and making it feel like a single park. Going back to Albert Town, our beloved Albert Town, okay? So the estate uh, was built on the site of 337 Albert Town houses and Butterfield Green on the site of 92 of those houses. Okay, so you can see how the complete transformation of the area from the 1850s to present day. What I wanna do just in the next uh, kind of 10 minutes, because I always overrun, uh, is just to take you through a stroll in Butterfield Green, okay? And show you how the area has changed as part of that development. So we're gonna do a lot of sort of before and after. I'm expecting a lot of gasps and oohs and ahs and so on, okay? Um, so just for orientation, so this is the area that we're talking about. So this is Shakespeare Walk. This view was taken from Milton Grove and you've got Allen Road and our kind of favorite sort of Shakespeare pub just behind these houses. This was the view of 72 and 94 Shakespeare Walk in 1977. Mm. Right. This is Allen Road, and this is the view today. I told you. <laughs> if you take a, if you keep walking towards Milton Grove and you go into the two uh, post-war buildings, Shelley House and Binion House, and before the development, this was the view. So this is actually the, the rear of those houses that we just looked at. And the view today. <laughs> mm. This was the view of, uh, oh, the caption is wrong. This is actually Milton Grove in 1982. This was the view from Shakespeare Walk. Okay, so this was just after all the houses were cleared and they were looking to redevelop and create phase one. This is it today. This is Milton Grove. This is Town Hall Approach. This is it today. So that was phase one. It was small. Like I said, they didn't know if they're going to have the money. So they tried to, you know, the play area, the, the bowl play area and so on. And this takes us now to phase two, which was further down Carper Road. Okay, so we're going to talk about all this. We're actually here, this institute. That's us, right? So we're going to talk about this whole area just behind us. This is what it looks like today, mostly. A nicely renovated play area. In the summer, you get 30 kids there, I mean, it's quite amazing. It's very, very busy compared to what it was before. There was just one sad swing and a slide. So this is the, the main road that was completely transformed. So you can see that Cowper Road, there were 1970s housing on the, the west side, but the east side was completely Victorian houses from Albert Town. Okay, so we're gonna start at this area before we're gonna move to the next angle. 
So this was the view of Carper Road looking north. So this is Allen Road in the distance. Okay, and this is it today. And this is just a little mashup <laughs> because you have to really. I mentioned the, as part of the work, it wasn't just about creating the open space, but it was also about through traffic and reducing some of the kind of the, the dangers associated with a lot of, I guess, kind of the traffic in the area. So they actually closed off Copper Road and also Spencer Grove, completely cut it off. And this is Town Hall Approach, okay? Now, I want you to look at and focus about this particular building here. This is number 39, Copper Road. I guess this photo is kind of 1930s, maybe late 20s. Now, I wanna show you a series of photos that were sent to me by um, someone that actually lived in Copper Road through the whole redevelopment as a teenager. Um, I think his house was probably the last one occupied in the road, and I'm really pleased to say that he's actually here tonight. So Mark is just sitting there looking at this, I guess a lot of memories flooding in, but he shared with me a few years ago photos that he took as the area and all the houses around him were completely being demolished. And you almost get the impression that like in Up, the Pixar film, he was the last house surrounded by all the builders and the bulldozers coming in. Because this house, number 39, this was it in 1982 when Mark saw it from his house at number 33. So this was 39, this is the Baptist church. Because today, three, two, one, I actually spent a um, really interesting 30 minutes with Mark a few months ago to record an interview in Butterfield Green of his memories growing up in the area and what it was like living through the whole redevelopment. It's on my website, uh, so just go and you can see it on, on YouTube. I just took like one minute snippet so you can get a feel for it because it was just so interesting to talk to someone that lived in one of those houses. Because funnily enough, you know, the history of Butterfield Green and the whole redevelopment Whereas history from 400 years ago, you can read in books and lectures and articles, it's much more difficult to find out what happened 50 years ago. It's in people's heads. It's not in any history book that I've seen yet. Um, and then on this side of the road, on the opposite side of the road here in Cowper Road, that they started emptying the houses out. People were moving out and people who we knew were saying, oh, we're moving, there's gonna be redevelopment here. And, and we're moving, we've, we've, we've been offered a place in wherever they wanted to go. And they, if they wanted to stay in the borough, they would be housed very quickly. But many people had decided that the area was, was, wasn't as good as it used to be for various reasons. And they want, this was their opportunity to move out. And that's what happened with my parents. And at, and at some point that happened, the house, all the houses opposite were demolished and the new houses that are here now were, were built. And we, we, uh, we made quite good friendships with quite a few of the neighbours opposite. And, um, and then it, we knew it was going to be our turn, but we didn't know exactly how long it was. Um, and it got to, when the mid-70s, um, the area became, it was getting worse. We had quite a few problems with different people moving out of houses alongside us and, and being turned into perhaps from a family home into perhaps four flats and there was a lot of coming and going. People would be there for a couple of months. Um, lots of really bad neighbors and it became, it, it became quite, a, a, quite traumatic. This story. is taking us further down Copper Road, right? So I think if you look at, I think number 33 was just there, right? Just about there. And today they actually created a whole new road on that site called Bennett Road. Exactly the same angle. Now, if you now walk towards Wardworth Road, which is just where we are now, in 1982, that would have been the view. Okay, so there was, uh, you can see Wardsworth Metal. There were also houses here that were demolished, and this is the rear of Carper Road. This is the view today. So sometimes people say, oh, you know, the good old days, scrap metal, Children can play, I don't know, make your own decision. Um, this was the view from Mark's back garden. Can you, that's every child's dream, right? Look, you've got a crane, you've got all these cars. 
Health and safety from the council did not visit for a very long time, I'm sure, right? Um, and this is more or less, have a look at, this is Stapleton Villas right here. So next time you go and play with your kids in the sand, you can tell them this used to be a scrap metal yard. <laughs> or you can show them this. <laughs> Looks like a nice sort of like postmodernistic sort of a street art of some sort. Uh, staying in Wardsworth Road, this was a photo that someone sent me a few years ago, really interesting. So this is the, the church, and these were the houses, there were 18 flats, I believe, in those two buildings. This is today. Now, the only reason why they kept the former Baptist church that was abandoned by that point, because part of the plan for Butterfield Green was to open a nursery in the, the church. They actually created a, a sunken play area at the back. Unfortunately, they ran out of funds to actually open the nursery. So now it's a residential property. But this was meant to be the, the play area for the, for the nursery. So we went through phase one, phase two, and this is now the last one, phase three, the biggest, the most ambitious one um, that was developed. So this is the, the main section, if you like, the green. Okay, a lot of dog walkers obviously there, people sort of sunbathing and playing, it's great in summer. There's a lot going on in that space. You know, there's the water feature that was renovated recently, the bandstand. I haven't seen any band playing there for a very long time, <laughs> maybe one day. Uh, but there's also like a lot, it's usually I think more like sort of uh, fitness instructors use that space, um, which is fine. Uh, and there's also a small little woodland area just to uh, jazz it up a bit. So let's look at what the whole area of phase one used to look like, or sorry, phase three. So we're gonna start with Allen Road. So we're gonna focus on this whole section here, right? So there was minimal impact on Allen Road. This was Allen Road circa 1984. So this is Allen Road, and this is Neville Road, Palatine Road, the Prince of Wales pub. You can see there were houses here. And this is a photo I took yesterday. Okay. Now, we looked at Copper Road from kind of the south looking north. Now we're going to do the other way. So we're going to look from Allen Road all the way down to Matthias Road. Wow. So this was taken from a flat in Allen Road. So this is Copper Road, and this is Matthias Road. All right, connecting straight line. And you can see this is, I think, early, mid-60s. You can get a sense of the condition of the houses. I mean, this was not a slum. Okay, they were probably a bit old and tired on the inside, uh, probably no longer single, single occupancy as they were originally, but still very nice. This was the corner of Cowper Road and Allen Road. You can see the street sign, this is a corner building. Today, this is it. So the gate to Butterfield Green, the main gate, is exactly where the road used to be. So next time you enter, you can think Cowper Road. Going further in Copper Road, this was the view as the houses were being demolished and torn down. Okay. This is number 75. I want you to look at the, kind of the, the roof of this 1970s housing as we transition to present day view. All right. So that was it, but it, it, the transformation is amazing just to see how it went from just a residential Victorian street to open space. Uh, just a few more. Um, so this is still Copper Road. This is Town Hall Approach. So this is today the gate, as you're going to see, to Butterfield Green or the, the, the railings, the fence to Butterfield Green because the view today is this. The mesh up. I want to just focus now on one or a, a, a pair of, of buildings there, number 71, 73, Copper Road. You can see the one with the, the gable end right there. So just remember that it's quite, because it's quite distinct in that row. This was taken as the street was being demolished. This was the inside. Someone actually told me that the council specifically removed the floorboards and other, other things so people didn't move in and started squatting them. 
that's the, if you think about that. This is where those two houses were. If they were like a lovely cutout. <laughs> this is the view from town hall approach. So this is the rear of those two houses. This was the out, outdoor toilet on a cold January night with the spiders and the mice, right? This is the view today. Just a few more. Um, moving on to Spencer Grove, so that's the next one. They also closed off that particular road. These were the houses that were in that section. So there was a shop, quite a few shops. Most of the shops were on Allen Road and Howard Road. Today, It took me a while to place this, because some, you know, some of these photos are just so different from present day. Um, so someone actually helped me by recognizing the name of this bakery in Allen Road. So that was kind of a good way of finding my bearings. And today, if you stood around that area and then you turn right looking east, this was the view as the houses were torn down. This is number 71, 73, 75, Culper Road. This is the substation. And last few, as I've been saying for 10 minutes. Uh, this is Spencer Grove. This is where the Adventure Playground is. The extension of the, the Adventure Playground was actually part of the Shakespeare Walk housing action area as well. So all these houses were cleared to make more space for the Adventure Playground. So those, those are the 92 houses that were demolished. And Wardsworth Road, but now looking at it from Palatine Road, used to have a row of, of shops and houses. Someone sent me actually recently uh, this lovely photo that was taken from one of those houses. So this is looking towards Neville Road. And further down Wardsworth Road, you had these shops and houses. Okay, and I'll finish with just three slides that show the area overall. So all this was going on. This was taken in 1986. So this is phase three. You can see it was just cleared, but it was open space. There was nothing there. It took a while to do the planting and the landscaping. Um, and even in the first few years, people were dumping rubbish there. It was constantly vandalized. It took a while. It took a while because uh, I think the case with any kind of public community, there's always going to be a few people I will try to ruin it. I mentioned the lovely article that one of the landscape um, architects wrote about the development of Butterfield Green. So this is a nice reflection, if you like, at the end of that article uh, titled A Place to Play. Butterfield Green is an example of a carefully designed and imaginative scheme with something to offer to all uh, sections of the community. It is rewarding to notice that the park seems to have encouraged a general improvement in the area and that the surrounding housing is gradually being upgraded. Okay, so this was again part of that big plan to just uplift the whole area. And just to wrap it up and connect it back to that sort of reform act of 1832 and the, the votes for the liberals and the extension of the suffrage and so on. I just thought that the fact that there was a tree in that caricature was quite fitting given that some of, or quite a few of those houses were then replaced by trees. So this was it. This was the creation of Butterfield Green. Felt like a whole night, I know. Uh, thank you very much.